like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to help the channel grow. Every little bit counts. Welcome back, hijackers. This is it, our final episode. A brief recap of the last episode, as the passengers began to take back control of the plane, we had one more twist. Amanda, who was seated just in front of Alec, the man who smuggled all the guns onto the plane, received a text. She went to the restroom to retrieve a weapon from her purse and immediately walked down the aisle towards the front of the plane. She shot the pilot in the head and locked herself in the cockpit. Well, for the last time, we have only one hour left till landing. Make sure your seatbelts are fastened, because for the next 12 minutes, we are being hijacked. As the passengers bravely overpower the hijackers one by one, Sam skillfully convinces Stewart to surrender what he believes is the only loaded weapon on board the airplane. He calmly explains to Stewart that he has two options, either hand over the weapon willingly or face the consequences of the enraged mob of passengers heading his way. After Sam successfully disarms Stewart, he faces another challenge as he is confronted by Jaunty. Armed with Terry's gun, Jaunty leads a furious mob of passengers towards the front of the plane in a bid to gain access to the cockpit. Tensions rise as Sam and Jaunty engage in a heated argument, both pointing their weapons at each other. At this time, we are still uncertain as to whether Sam possesses the only loaded weapon. However, the truth quickly unfolds when Jaunty attempts to shoot Sam in the leg, only to discover that his gun is loaded with blanks. As Jaunty and the rest of the passengers realize that Sam holds the only loaded weapon, he quickly assumes control of the situation. Sam surveys the plane and announces to everyone that the hijacking is over. However, they now face a completely different problem. While interrogating Stuart and Jamie, Sam diligently tries to find out the identity of the individual currently in the cockpit. He discovers that Amanda was not involved in the hijacking plan and that she is unwillingly caught up in a much larger scheme orchestrated by powerful individuals on the ground. Meanwhile, back at Collingwood House, the group learns that this incident extends beyond a prison break, it was actually part of a coordinated scheme known as a bear raid. A what? Bear raid. Bear is in the animal. They hijack the plane, then leak it to the media. Before you know it, shares in Kingdom Airlines are falling faster than the plane itself. But if a share price is dropping, don't you lose money? Not if you bet the other way. The Foreign Secretary, Louise, receives an urgent briefing from a member of her team regarding the dispatch of two Typhoon fighter jets by the Royal Air Force to assess the situation in the airspace. Upon their arrival, Louise will face a critical five-minute window to decide whether to issue the order to shoot down the hijacked aircraft. The Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary engage in a heated debate over whether to shoot the plane down and who should be responsible for giving the order. There are 200 people on that plane. If it strikes central London, it would kill twice that again. You can't say that. The choice is simple. There is no choice. Either we let it go or we stop it. We shoot it down while it's over water, but not over the capital. The Prime Minister decides. No, she acts on advice. She will make the statement, and let's be clear, the decision is ours. Devia inquires about the passengers' phones, suggesting that they should be given the opportunity to call their families and express their love, considering the possibility of a plane crash. However, Stewart declares that returning the phones to the passengers is a bad idea. Why? Why no phones? That they'll all tell the ground what's happening. They'll know that we don't know who's flying the plane. When they hear that, they'll shoot us down. Alice from British Air Traffic Control finally manages to establish direct communication with Sam, after her team continually called all the phone numbers listed on the flight's manifest, eventually getting through to one of the passengers' phones. Initially, Sam is hesitant to be completely truthful with Alice about the current situation on board the plane, fearing that revealing everything might lead to the government's decision to shoot them down. However, Alice convinces Sam that he can trust her and that her sole intention is to ensure the safe landing of the plane, with no further harm to the passengers. Despite the Home Secretary's valid case for why he believes the plane should be shot down, he hesitates when it's time to present his recommendation to the Prime Minister. Instead, the Foreign Secretary steps in and takes charge, 
deciding to have the jets stand down and opt for the evacuation of all high-value targets in and around the London area. Alice tells Sam the good news as we see the jets disengaging from the airplane, however she also tells him the not-so-good news about how the plane still has to somehow be landed. We finally see Johnny and Edgar after their highly elaborate escape. Seeking refuge, they find themselves in the driveway of a rundown house in the countryside. Johnny is eager to contact Amanda and make their way to the helicopter, scheduled to depart in an hour, in a bid to distance themselves from the authorities he believes to be hot on their trail. On the other hand, Edgar appears preoccupied with monitoring Kingdom Airlines stock prices and how much money they are making. As Sam and his small group of trusted passengers attempt to find a way to get through to Amanda, they are joined by Alec, who managed to make his way up to the front of the airplane. Alec sheds light on his and Amanda's involvement in the hijacking, providing crucial information. We catch a glimpse of Edgar's tablet displaying Kingdom Airlines stock plummeting. Once again, Johnny is anxious about the risk of getting caught and urges Edgar to close the deal. However, Edgar remains stubborn in his pursuit of making as much money as possible, even shouting, we lie low until the plane crashes. End of conversation. As Johnny had his own plan, he confides in the third man at the house where they are lying low, expressing the need to speed things up a bit. Suddenly, without warning, the man sneaks up behind Edgar and shoots him in the back of the head. Now, this next part, I admit I did not see coming. I was going on and on about Edgar being the brains of the Cheapside firm, while Johnny didn't say two words the entire episode, relegating him to more of a sidekick role. Well, kudos to the writers because they definitely had me fooled. We see Amanda visibly regretting killing the pilot as she looks at his tablet with the picture of his family on the screen. She finally breaks down and calls Sam on her phone. He uses her empathy and is able to extract exactly what Johnny and Edgar's plan involves. It also starts a relationship that he's able to exploit later on. Sam skillfully attempts to persuade Amanda to open the cockpit door safely, emphasizing the potential danger to her and the plane if the passengers resort to breaking it down. In a desperate move, he lies to her, claiming that lead hijacker Stewart confessed to him about the threat to her daughter's life, and how, regardless of her cooperation, the firm won't leave any witnesses alive. The combination of these manipulative tactics convinces Amanda to allow Sam into the cockpit. The plane touches down right at the beginning of the runway, with both Amanda and Sam firmly pressing on the brakes. The impact is still too great and causes the plane to start falling apart, and in a violent crash, both engines are completely ripped off the wings. The plane nosedives and skids across the runway, eventually catching fire. There's a very tense moment in the British Air Traffic Control Center when they lose contact with Sam and fear that the worst has happened. The plane, besides the engines manage to stay intact as we see it surrounded by emergency services. When Sam is finally able to find his phone, he tells Alice that they've landed on the ground. The tension subsides as they confirm the successful landing despite the harrowing experience. Amidst the chaotic scene of evacuating everyone from the smoke-filled plane and ensuring the hijackers are separated from the rest of the passengers, the SWAT team, relying solely on physical descriptions, mistakenly identifies Alec as Stewart. It seems that Stewart managed to break free from his restraints at some point during the landing. Meanwhile, Sam ventures back into the plane to retrieve Marsha's gift. However, to his surprise, the plane door closes behind him, and he realizes his gun is no longer where he left it. In a deadly game of cat and mouse, Stuart relentlessly chases Sam around the plane. Thinking on his feet, Sam devises a plan to use his phone as a decoy to distract Stuart. He lures Stuart into an empty bathroom, where he successfully disarms him. Meanwhile, the SWAT team breaches the airplane door, arriving just in time to apprehend both men. With guns pointed at them, Stuart and Sam are forced to their knees, ending the intense confrontation. Sam and Stuart find themselves on their knees, facing each other, with their hands up as SWAT takes control of the situation. Sam looks at Stuart and says, say cheese, mirroring what Stuart once said to him when their roles were reversed, and Sam was the one being subdued. With the situation now under control, Sam retrieves his phone and walks off the plane, as the scene fades to black. So, as this is a miniseries, this should be the end of it. However, I did watch an interview with Idris Elba, 
where he said he wouldn't be opposed to coming back for another season as long as they can find a clever way to do it. He mentioned that if the writers can come up with a clever storyline that doesn't involve a plane hijacking, and if the fans want to see it, then he is all for coming back. All in all, I thought the series was great, and I give it a solid 7.5 out of 10. The only part where I felt the writing lost me was at the end when they made it out to be a battle between Sam and Stuart. I thought that was just a little bit of lazy writing, considering how great all the writing was about everything else that happened on the show, which didn't involve Sam and Stuart. If I had to pick a breakout star of the show, I would choose the character Jamie Constantinou, played by actress Amy Kelly. She easily stole every scene she was in, and I've already started downloading the movie Sket, which she premiered in when she was only 18. I will leave a link to the IMDB page in the details section of this video. Before I turn it over to you guys, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to the few, and I mean very few, people who watch these videos. I had a blast, and I hope you did too. Now, it's your turn to tell me what you think. Was Hijacked as good for you as it was for me? Would you be interested in seeing a second season that doesn't take place on a plane? And what did you think of Amy Kelly's performance? Was it as fantastic as I thought, or was I just starstruck?